next one. Um, so um, I suppose this one is for John and um, we know that Eamon Ryan leader of the Green Party, was very much um, actively anti-CETA. He stood at the door with me for his photos back in the day. Um, he has very much done a, a public uh, U-turn um, and he's given kind of three key reasons for that U-turn. So um, I'm going to go through kind of just outline each one of those and then I'm going to ask uh, maybe John if you can take us through each one of those points and um, just if you can explain maybe the significance of those changes and whether or not that would be there would be any validity um, or power in changing one's mind based on based on these these um, changes um, you know that it would change your mind about the dangers of CETA because of these big changes so I know Lorna also touched on some of them there and 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 also Barry before so the first one is that the European Court of Justice came Came back to say that these trade deals are subservient to EU law and public um, interest law is protected. So that's the first one. The second one is in 2018, both CETA partners, so Canada and the EU, put in that trade deals had to comply with the Paris Agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement. And the third year, the third one is two years ago with Canada, the EU agreed that we will move towards a multilateral investment court system and that we are on path to that. So that's a reason that this is this is it's okay now so maybe um john if you can maybe take us through those um one by one that would be great thank you grand laura yeah i'll try my best uh, i suppose the first thing just before i go into each of them to, just to say that you know these kind of um changes co cosmetic adjustments and so on as well as the whole repackaging of of the isds that we've already talked about like these you know it, it's not insignificant and, and these are the really the result of the the consciousness and the campaigning that you know all of you have been doing over the years and they are concessions that are that have been made by by sites of power because they felt that they had to make uh some concessions but you know ultimately there it's it's really you know it's it's tinkering around the edges and and it's um in its optics really at at, at best and so you know the, the short answer is that they're, they're not fundamentally changing the the issues and the structural problems that we're talking about here and they're not uh uh i would say you know in, in any way meriting that you know the the the, 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 the extent of of the u-turn that you've um that you've mentioned there and so um right so just to try to try and go into them uh briefly did i'll start with the paris agreement maybe just a lot of you will be more in deeply aware of some of the weaknesses and the limitations of the paris agreement itself but if we just leave that aside and assume broadly it's it's better that you have reference to the paris agreement than than not uh yes the the, the, the ceta joint committee made this recommendation in in 2018 so the eu and canada essentially together basically made this recommendation this statement saying that they recognize the importance of the paris agreement to addressing climate change generally and that uh in facilitating and and liberalizing trade and investment under CETA they will also take action where relevant to, to try and address climate change and promote uh, the mutual um, supportiveness or something like that of, of trade and climate so they're so they're, it, it's 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 some language that they've added that sounds nice enough but ultimately it's still not recognizing you know the, the fundamental obstacles that capitalism and its logic of continuous growth pose for the, the scale of meaningful climate action that, that's needed uh, and the, the recommendation itself and the language of it talks about how economic growth and environmental protection go hand in hand and that trade and investment can make positive contributions to sustainable development and so it's it's you know still very much stuck in this kind of um uh fantasy world really where where a slightly greener version of the current uh, status quo or slightly greener version of capitalism will be able to reduce emissions enough to reverse the trajectory of, of global warming um, while you know still being able to to pursue economic growth all around and trading more and consuming more resources to do so so there's you know issue there with the whole uh, premise and, and substance i think of that of that claim and then there's also the, the the more technical legal question of what status does that recommendation have and if a case was to come up in the investment court where the protections that CETA give to an investor are adversely impacted let's say by a, a state's climate action policy what takes priority how will that be adjudicated how what, 
what what will be given priority in the, how that uh, dispute is is decided. And so that brings us to, to the other point then about the, the European Court of Justice and what it said in its opinion in uh, 2019, which has also been used as 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 a, as a basis for um, for for change in in, in policy. Uh, that opinion um, basically was about uh, about um, the what they call the autonomy of the EU legal order and the question of whether CETA could be incompatible with with EU law. And essentially, in short, it said that uh, it didn't find a basis to say that CETA is inherently incompatible with EU law. And it based that on the fact that CETA was its own standalone international treaty. It wasn't trying to override uh, EU law or take jurisdiction over EU law interpretation from the European Court of Justice for its own tribunal. And so the European Court says as long as the ICS doesn't try to override our jurisdiction over questions of EU law, uh, then there's no there's no clash. But the, the problem uh, beyond that is, is that CETA has its own text and its own set of provisions to uh, apply and and it can you know it, there's every chance it can make decisions that are uh, not what we, we would see as progressive or not in the interests of labor rights or environmental protection and so on and still be entirely um, compatible with with uh, with with the system that that it's been designed and and ultimately we have to remember this you know the, the text of and the treaty is about facilitating and promoting and protecting investment uh, investment rights and investment. Um, properties and profits and and so there you know there's um some useful language and some positive language in the in the european court's decision about that the investment court will have to take some account of the public interest and the right to regulate in the public interest but you know the the, the analysis of investment lawyers that i've seen never mind environmental lawyers is that this is you know it's it, it's quite optimistic um, and wishful thinking to be to be expecting that that this will lead to the investment court prioritizing in every case the public interest over the corporate interest. And what we've seen with these treaties and these tribunals time and time again is that once they're in place, they take on a life of their own. They're a living beast and they adapt and mutate to the context and the conditions as they involve. And they find new ways to uh, protect corporate uh, rights sometimes in in quite subtle and and indirect ways and sometimes by uh, seeming to give um um more weight and more account to human rights or, or environment or, or public interest but but actually using that as as a smokescreen to 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 continue to prioritize the the investor rights and so you know the ultimately the fundamental question is why you know we don't know what will happen but why we take this risk and leave ourselves uh, exposed to this when you know there, there's no tangible benefits to doing so from the point of view of of the public interest in uh, across the spectrum uh the last one then very quickly the, the multilateral investment court essentially this is what, what the eu is is proposing and planning to, to essentially make what it's what it's come up with as the investment court system in ceta uh, a permanent global multilateral version of this and so they've been they brought this now to the united nations and are, are presenting it there as this progressive reform of international investment law but again if you read what international lawyers and researchers and activists have, um, in the global south are saying that you know th this is another imposition and uh, form of, of abuse of power from the european union it's trying to implement its own system uh, it's calling it multilateral but it's not meaningfully meaningfully engaging us uh, so far in that um, and it's you know it's it's most likely that this isn't going to be to the to the benefit or the advantage of the of the poorer countries in how it's ultimately implemented if it if it is so it's hard to know how long that process will take or if it'll ever be successful but ultimately you know it is the same structure and the same model as ISDS investment court system and and therefore the same problems just on a bigger scale so um you know i don't really see it as as a valid reason in any way for the for the green party to be to go from being unequivocally opposed to see to to now you know supporting the the very same agreement